Hey folks and welcome back to Tower TV. I'm Wyatt here in Virginia Beach and we are here with the Conflict 47 Battle Report from Warlord Games. But before we actually get into it, we have a few new releases hitting the shelves today and I just thought I'd run you through a few of them because these are very sought after things and we want to let you guys know that we have goodies for you. Also available with the Tower TV coupon code. As a huge thank you to everyone watching at home, on checkout on our website, any order of $25 or over for the first time, you can use that code TOWERTV for $5 off any order of $25 or more. But that being said, what can you spend that good old coupon code on? You can spend it on all of the releases for Kaldheim that are coming out. <laughs> Excuse me. Draft booster boxes, set booster boxes, collector booster boxes, commander decks, and bundles. All are available on our website now that the whole set has dropped. Also coming out is Yu-Gi-Oh! Blazing Vortex with booster boxes starting at $79.99. Moving on, right down the line is Pokemon V Battle with Blastoise and Venusaur on the front cover. So if you're looking to get into playing Pokemon as well as collecting, very good place to start. But speaking of collecting, let us collect some good old pieces of our history if I can actually grab the box. <laughs> some good old pieces of our history with fossils to dig up dinosaurs and all of the secrets of the earth. But, you know, this video isn't a secret. I told you guys what it was. It is Conflict 47. What if World War II was able to continue into the future? Let us find out in this battle report and let's get to it. Transition. Tower. Hey folks and welcome back to Tower TV. I'm Wyatt and we have Scott and Tanner here to bring you some conflict. I'll be quite honest, Scott, I, I have no idea what this game is. Yeah, I, I, see, <laughs> I see it every day, but I have no idea. So what exactly are we getting ourselves into? So basically conflict is uh, you take bolt action and you just add in all kinds of weird, crazy tech. I uh, you know, think Fallout. That's a diff different alternate version of World War II history with all kinds of crazy weapons and robots and zombies. I see a tank with a plasma rifle on the back of the starter box. It's actually a Tesla cannon. Te that fires lightning. Oh. Well. <laughs> it, it's wonderful. It is absolutely wonderful. <laughs> it's a very unique weapon that actually has different penetration values so it does it has good uses against infantry and tanks. Oh, and I'm assuming all of this is going to be explained in the battle report that is to come? I have a tank with a light Tesla cannon. Ah. Uh, the demo. Alright, and if I may ask, what is with the mask? Because you guys seem to be on a theme here. So we're going to be running the Australians and the Americans. Hmm. I'll be running my Australians, which, as some of you that may have played Bolt Action or Combat 47 know, the Australians don't have a selector in Combat 47 yet. So, I'm actually running them as Canadians, but they are my Australians. That's an awesome thing about some of these kits is, you know, the British Army starter set, you can actually build them as British or uh, Canadians or Australians. Nice. And it yeah. also works because you can use the regular models. So he just took the red regular Australian models for his infantry. And then he adds the weird vehicles on top of it and it makes it a conflict army. Exactly. And you learn something new every day. But you know what? That's enough jibber jabber out of us. Let's just hop straight to it. Let's go! Hello, Tanner. Hello. Oh, wait. So, what, what, what's currently happening here with this giant board that we have? So, right now, we just got our board set up. We're about to start bringing out units. We got our scenario chosen. Um, I will be charging onto the field, onto this specific beach with my Australians, and Scott will be defending with his uh, U.S. Airborne, his mixed other kind of conflict forces. Um, and then, I know you kind of wrote a bit of a kind of a scenario for it, kind of like almost like a training exercise, something like that, right? Yeah, just mostly that this is a, it's a training exercise for the Australians and uh, Americans are planning to take back a lot of the territory that, uh, which is in, a little bit in the lore of the, the main rulebook, uh, they're planning to do another invasion of Guadalcanal, so they're doing a little training exercise to make sure they know what they're doing. Yeah, this seems like a very brutal training exercise, just a little bit. It's live ammunition, you know, I mean, it's no biggie. It's extreme training. <laughs> right, and so we're about to start bringing out some models. Absolutely. Definitely. Sweet, let's do it.
And so, Scott, if I remember right, this is miniature wargaming? Absolutely. Can, can you explain to the possibly new or interested players out there what the concept is? So basically, these are models set to a certain scale where you build and paint them. Uh, you can base them or you don't have to paint them. Um, and you put them on the table, you use a uh, tape measure to move them around. They, have, they all have different kinds of rules and different kinds of stats for moving, shooting, doing all kinds of different things. And you just base it off of the individual models themselves and go from there. And so whenever we have customers come into tower, usually I use the phrase, chess with machine guns and tanks. That seem about accurate or not quite? Essentially, uh, but not as restrictive on like a, uh, on like a chess board. Mm. You can basically do whatever you want as long as it's within the realm. If you want to run them in a zigzag, zigzag line, you can do that. I, I like it. I like zigzags. Uh, what, 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 what is that? So that is, that's a huge walker. This is a Merlin. Uh, a Merlin. Yes. We have Merlin. wizards. Oh, we do. We <laughs> absolutely do. It's wonderful. We have wizards. <laughs> so the Merlin is the basically the British Comic 47. It's their heavy assault mech. It's their largest mech that they have. Um, what is really neat about it is uh, I don't. I believe Scott is bringing one of them today. Which mech are you bringing? I am bringing the Bruin. So what's really awesome is that the British and the U.S. they oh, share Lord. a lot of their specific forces. So Scott may not be able to take the Merlin but I could take some of his walkers and vice versa, some of the more medium, smaller walkers, but this is very specific just to me, as well as my little bombardier, my little tiny dude right here. It's really nice, really small, powerful, great little thing. He's like a happy little turtle. He's like a happy little angry turtle. What's up, dude? <laughs> He's very angry. Oh, no. Is he about to be angry on some Americans today? Oh, he yeah, definitely will be. Oh, wow. All right, so I'm seeing a lot of models on the board. And so what is entirely happening for us today? So right now, what we're kind of setting up right now, we're just getting our units all out on the table. We're trying to make sure we got the right amount of order dice, make sure we got all of our dice, our D6s, our pin markers, our blast templates, stuff like that. Uh, tape measure, just having everything ready to go. Uh, we've already got our scenario chosen. Okay. Uh, like I kind of mentioned before, it's, it's gonna be a training exercise. The Australians are gonna be assaulting and attacking some defending US. So what's basically gonna be happening is that Scott's gonna have half his force already in these buildings or inside these tree line hidden. My force is gonna be coming out of, or what's the right word for it? Simulated coming out of the Higgins boats and the LCM assaulting his force and trying to basically find his units while Scott is waiting for his reinforcements to come back in. And once his forces come back in, they get properly relieved and he gets his forces out. I get victory points off of that. Um, but yeah, I can basically go in there, take control over those three buildings, and we get victory points off of certain scenarios. And turn over to the book over here. Right. And so, it's relief in place is the scenario we'll be playing. Huh. And so this is the setup I have. So as a defender, I'll set up basically in this section here in the middle, and then my objective the victory points is, as he said, to push me out while my guys are trying to relieve the guys that have been holding the beach and push in with fresh units to hold the beach. Nice. And he's trying to take advantage of that opportunity and push me all the way out. All right. And luckily it works just right with the board we have. Because we have Tanner over here, the aggressor, and we have Scott the defender. Works out pretty nice. Yeah. All right. Let's go and set it up. And on the board, we have the Aussies about to come on, but awaiting them is the Americans. Waiting on the board. In buildings. Multiple yeah. buildings. Hiding under buildings. Oh, yeah. And so, how is the turn going to progress in a game of conflict? So, every turn for uh, conflict or for bolt action is exactly the same. Each individual unit has an order dice. So, we have an order bag and Every unit has one assigned to them. So this, this scout card here has a dice assigned to it. If I pull a dice from the bag, I assign it an order on, on the dice. So I advance, which is just like a normal slow maneuver so I can still shoot. I can run, which is my full max movement, but that's my entire turn. I can ambush, so I lie in wait, getting ready to do shots. I can go down in response to getting shot at to take more cover. And then I assign it to the vehicle, so I tell him I want him to fire. He fires, 
That's his turn done. We pull out another dice from the bag, and it's it's random. It can go to either side. So it could be me for five maneuvers in a row, or it could be back and forth the entirety of the time. And so there's multiple dice in here? Yes. So for each side we have different colored dice. So like for Scott's instance, like you said, he pulled out. He's playing as black dice. I'm playing as this light green. And then of course, like you mentioned before, we have a dice for each unit. So like, for example, Scott has eight dice. I have 10. So then you would think I have a slight advantage, but he has more elite units. I have more kind of regular and he has a lot of veteran units. So he's, he's a little more expensive for his points, but they're going to last longer and live longer or they should. I'll should make, in theory, right? I'll, in make theory. Sure they, I'll make sure they don't. In theory, but we all know how dice work. Exactly. Oh yeah. And so is the dice the only part of it or does shooting come after the dice? So shooting is involved with the dice. Okay. So whenever I issue an order to the unit, say I issue it a fire order, I can then fire, I, I choose to, they choose to fire as their only action. So uh, say he's got a unit directly in front of my guys, they would then take their shots. And for this instance, I can only get a few shots because they're in a building and you can only have so many people shooting out of a window because it's very tiny. So these two guys in the front window would fire, these two guys over here would fire, and then these two guys over here would fire. They would all roll their shots based on different weapons that they have, and then we would roll to see if I hit, and then if I hit, I have to roll to see if I wound. And as Tanner mentioned, that's based on veterancy. So very obviously, guys that have been in a fight longer know how to avoid getting shot. They're a little bit better at it sometimes. So it's a little bit harder to kill veterans than it is an experienced troops. Seems fair. All right, let's see how this goes. Let's roll some dice. All right, first dice pull. Oh, of course. So first dice pull is the Australians. And as Tanner is assaulting the beach, he has to come up the beach. So he has to come off the board as he's assaulting me. I'm already in defended positions and he's got to kick me out. So I'm going to choose advance for my Merlin. Advance him up his 12. Get him right there. And I'm going to have him fire. We'll go ahead and fire the coax, not the coax, the dual linked HMGs into your guys in the building here. As well as everything. We'll put all the weapons into him. We'll try to knock him out first thing. So they're out of half range. So I'm going to move and shoot. So you take negatives just like any other game. So what Tanner just did was he was adding together his base value to hit, which is three, with he moved, so that would be a minus one, so it would make it a four. They're at long range, so that would add another one, making it a five. So it's a little bit harder to hit the more stuff you do. So as I explained before with the fire action, they didn't move, they didn't do anything, so it's a lot easier for them to aim and fire. Mm. Some vehicles, uh, the Americans have a special rule. If they're veterans, they have what's called a gyro stabilizer, which means they get to ignore that. Hmm. And so where can all this information be found for like all the firing, shooting, and the weapons? This handy dandy rule book, which oh. comes in each of the starter sets, which is very nice. It's a smaller uh, version that has everything the big book has. It's really nice. I've had it since I got the German starter box, and it's useful for every single nation. Um, and then they have two other little expansion books that go a little bit more into the other nations. So this one goes a little bit more into Japan. This one goes a little bit more into Italy. They add a bunch of different units for different factions. Some of the rules are updated. Um, Bolt Action is in its uh, second edition, and Conflict was released in first edition. So it, it's a mixture of first edition rules and second edition rules with these updates. Though so you can play with all the first edition rules if you like. And the more you know. All right, so are these Americans becoming Swiss cheese? We shall see. Oh yes, that's really nice. All right. So move and shoot, long range. What all, what all are you shooting? So I know you have, it's a medium AT gun, mm -hmm. anti-tank gun. It's a heavy. It's a heavy anti-tank gun. It's a heavy okay. AT gun, yep. So and then the two linked HMGs on his arm. Those are one firing into that. So this is the HMG's first, and fives. It has three hits. 
And then they are veterans, so I would need fives. So I got a plus one to penetrate. So, I so need heavier weapons. Obviously, it's a 50 caliber machine gun. It's going to be a little bit easier to kill. People. It's it's got a lot more stopping power. So it has a plus one penetration, meaning their five to wound the veterans is now a four. But they are in heavy cover. They are in heavy cover. That is true. So heavy cover does give them a bonus to being wounded. So it stays the same. Yeah, it does. It balances out. Because they're in a, it's, we take that back. I apologize. It's not the building, it, it's not the heavy cover itself, it's being inside a building. Buildings offer a bonus to damage. Hmm. Correct. Oop. 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 Oh, none. No I got wounds. a two, a three, and another three. So that's not going to be any wounds, but they will receive pins. No. So he did hit me, though he did not wound me, I receive a pin marker. So they're being shot at, so they react a little bit differently. Sometimes they keep their heads down, sometimes they're able to rally and get over the stress. And every time they're hit, it adds a pin marker. But with him shooting all from that one attack, when he shoots his second weapon, it does not add a second pin marker. Except it might because it's an HE weapon. But just because he hits with it doesn't mean it that she does it. If I hit with it, I will need a four to hit because I moved and I'm shooting with it. But it has an incredibly long range. range. I'm definitely within half. It's 72, so definitely within half. So then I would just need a four to hit. Does oh, not hit. oh, thank goodness. What we get? Got it was three. a three. Oh, no. Just barely missed. Just barely. The Americans live to fight another day. Bring that dice back. Did I, did I see kangaroos on the side of that dice? It sure did. Oh, my God. I love it. Can I, can I focus? Can you stop the bit? Yeah. Each nation actually yeah. has custom printed dice for them. Well, just about every nation. Uh, the Germans have an iron cross on it. The oh, Soviets it. have a, uh, a sickle hammer on it. Uh, the Americans have you can the Americans you can get a couple. You can get the 101st Airborne dice. Um, you can get um, just regular American star on the dice. Uh, they have Japanese dice with the rising sun. Oh, they have an anchor for the Marines. They do. All right. Next dice pool is now that by Merlin has shot only caused a single pin, failed to kill anybody. He's going to be sit there in shame for now. Back to my turn. Another Australian. This will be a lot more simple. So another tan dice for another Australian. I'm going to go ahead and have one of the infantry squads run up the board. So the normal movement is six inches. If I were to advance with them, they'd only move half. But if they're going to run, they'll do a full 12 inches. But they can't act afterwards. No shooting. Basically, it means they take all of their actions to be able to run double speed. Hmm. That is them for that turn. Scott. Now it is an American dice. Whoa. Board travel. Mm. All right. What's this dice go? So this dice, I believe it is going to go to my air observer. So my air observer is a special, uh, it's a special command unit that can call in airstrikes. And as Americans, they have air superiority, which is a special rule. So they are the only ones to get two for the price of one. And that's what these two planes are for. P-40 Warhawks. And those are actually not bolt action miniatures. Uh, they don't. They have some miniatures. Uh, they have Blood Red Skies, which is a different game entirely. We won't get into it. But I like the size of these, they fit, and they're really cool planes. Yeah. They also have a better paint job than I ever did. <laughs> that is for sure. But yes, what shall this overseer do? So, uh, as, as the observer, he has to issue a fire order to do it. He can't move and do that as well. So, we'll just issue him a fire order, and now we can actually take this off. So we can actually get to him a little bit better. Oh, the terrain has removable roofs! Is that how you say it? Roofs, 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 roofs. 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 So <laughs> it's it's a rough word. We'll go. We'll just go with that. Oh God. <laughs> so then, uh, when he calls in his airstrike, uh, Tanner, you played a little bit more as the Americans. Uh, why don't you explain that? Is this is actually my first time playing as the Americans? Uh -huh. So basically, how it works is now, as been before, you have like the actual like bombers and all kinds of other things. Like for the planes, they have like artillery. Uh, the way that the U.S. is a little bit different is he calls it on a specific unit. It stays on that unit and moves around with the unit. If you were to call an artillery, like I have an artillery observer, which you'll see here in a bit, 
uh, it's stagnant, stays in place, does not move. It's just a really big blast radius. Uh, the Air Force Observer, on the other hand, it's going to target that one unit specifically. So if I were to put it on, if you were for my Merlin, for example, my Merlin. Which I didn't explain it, but it is going to be targeting the Merlin. Right. Um, kind of figured it was. If my Merlin moves up here to 12 inches, it's basically got it mark it's like marked. He's going to put a marker on it, and it's going to stick with it. Now, at the start of the next turn, at the beginning of the next turn, we roll a, a dice on a chart, which we'll talk about when we get to that point. And it'll come in. It won't come in. It'll be delayed. Uh, and then if it does actually come in, there's another chart we roll on. And then that'll defer or basically show what comes in. There's also a chance that it could actually come in and strafe his own guys. If it's unfortunately a rookie pilot. Yes. Now explain uh, the, the marker a little bit, as, uh, as, I, as I did. The, these are simply just markers to show where the airstrike is coming in at. Right. So when he puts the actual piece down, uh, what he'll do is he'll put like a smoke marker or something on him. And then when the plane comes in, he'll designate a direction that the plane's coming in from. If we have flak weapons, which flak weapons are anything that's like a coax or any kind of pintle mounted weapon, that's on top of a vehicle. Like, for example, I know you have a coax on his Bruin Walker over there, or excuse me, a pintle mount on a Bruin Walker. It has a special rule called flap. So when the planes come in, if he can see that plane coming in, he has the option to shoot at it. All right? Sometimes you will, sometimes you won't. It's kind of hard to hit them. Uh, it doesn't happen too often because not a lot of people take the pintle weapons, but it's pretty cool. Or bring the aircraft. Correct. Not a lot of people bring aircraft. So if it actually goes off, we'll, we'll put it on the boards, you know, directions coming in from. Um, I don't have anything to shoot at it. He's not going to shoot at his own craft. So it'll be a nice little display. So and there's, the, there's the smoke marker placed on the Merlin to show that he's called an airstrike on the Merlin. Nice. So with that, with the observer, that's all he gets to do this turn. So back out of back. Next turn. And it's another American. Woo! Um, so for this squad, I believe we'll activate these guys here and do a little of what I explained a little bit before. So we're going to issue them a fire order so they don't have to move, they don't have to do anything. They're just going to open fire on the guys that have come on the beach. Now because they're in a building, it's very cramped. They have to shoot out of windows. So a maximum amount of people you can have on a window is two or a door. You can have two as well. So it's going to be two guys here around the outside. One little fancy guy laying under there being sneaky. These two guys in the front window here, and then these two guys on the outside. Now when we take a measurement and see what we have, most of these guys are SMGs, as airborne can bring a lot of SMGs. Well, the SMG is only a 12 inch range. So it appears most of them are out of range. However, I do have a light machine gun, which is 36 inches. So when we measure from the unit, He'll be at long range, but because he didn't move or anything like that, he'll just be hitting on fours. Mm. And the same thing with the bar, uh, the BAR is a weapon all to its own. It's got its own special rules and stats. And so we'll measure directly from him as well. And his range is 30, so he's not within half either. He'll also be hitting on fours. And so to differentiate, I'll just use different colored dice. And now I'm used to playing Germans. Germans have extra dice for machine guns, so it's a little sad to not have as many dice. But we'll do the two red for the bar and the four of these for the light machine gunner. And they're, since they're both hitting on the same number, I just roll them at the same time and it makes them easier. So we have two hits. The rest of them miss horribly. So they will take a pin marker and then I will see if I can wound them. And they don't have any special characteristics for penetration or anything like that. Uh, what uh, experience are your guys? These guys are regulars. They're regulars, so regulars wound on a 4 plus. We'll see if we can get a wound. We got a wound. One Australian down. One down. Yeah. Wait, were we supposed to be using light ammunition? It's too late. Okay. We put away the blanks. And that's their turn. The real guns are coming out. Oh, Ruh -ruh. <laughs> Again, Eason Point shows the randomness of drawing dice. And so, if all the dice are gone, is your turn over? Or does the dice bag reset? So, say all of my dice come out before all of his come out, 
he would get the rest of the dice and get to move with impunity. Then once it's done, all of the dice go back in the bag for surviving units, and then we pull them out again for turn two. Hmm. Very simple. I like nice it. Nice and effective. Simple's nice. Now since I don't want to move my lieutenant, he's in a very good spot, he's holding the objective, he doesn't really need to move. Um, and these guys don't really have a target, they don't have any anti-tank weapons, so they can't really fire at the Merlin, it wouldn't be a very... Can't really fire at Big Walker over there. They, they can fire, but it'd be kind of pointless. So what we're going to do is I'm going to wait to bring on the Tesla because I kind of want to see what it does to infantry because it has this very cool rule where it doesn't do much damage, but if it hits, you roll a dice and it can arc to the rest of the guys in the squad. Lightning. Lightning fingers. Nikola Tesla is the invention of the future. <laughs> so what we will do is we'll go ahead and bring on the Bruin support walker. Support, huh? <laughs> it says it's support, but it's got two giant rocket pods on its arms and a giant cannon on the front. It's, it's American, I mean. Yeah. What else would it have? Seems fair. <laughs> So it's, it's uh, one of the more, um, all of the American mechs are very versatile. Uh, a lot of them run on the same chassis. They actually have three different mechs that have the exact same body, just different arms or a different torso. And you know they have different roles and different specialties as Americans like to do. They like to make one platform that's very versatile and can be changed to use different types of weapons. And this is by far my favorite because giant rocket arms. It's kind of hard to argue with rocket arms. It really is. I mean, just, just look at them. They're giant rocket arms. Need I say more? So he will go ahead and advance on the board. And vehicles, uh, he did not split his fire, but vehicles are very unique in that they're able to split their fire. They're one of the only units able to do so. So because we have multiple weapon systems on these vehicles, I can decide to fire my main gun as long as it's something in my front arc, I can fire it, say, at the Merlin, and then I can fire the rocket pods at the infantry. And so he has the same movement. It's a walker, so he does the exact same thing with a 12-inch uh, advance on the board. Now you'll notice I don't have a base for this guy. Um, I found him stable enough. I really didn't need to bother with the base. Um, but we're, as a community, we're very, very easygoing, very fun. We're not going to sit there and argue over a couple of inches. Um, you know, we're, we're very lenient of, that's, that's where the base would be. He's well within it, so we'll just measure it to the, like the front of the chest plate and go from there. And how big is your community local? Um, I, we have about 60 members in our group. Um, there are uh, five of us as moderators who started it up and started getting everything going. We've had a lot of community grow. Uh, we had a painting competition. I believe it's still going on, actually. It's still ongoing. Um, with a uh, with a cash prize for tower credit, I believe it is. Yes. And um, we had a lot of interaction. It was really great. We had a lot of people come together and get brand new armies. Um, one of our community members built an entire town by himself. He's still got a couple more buildings to go, but it's very impressive. It's, hey, you know, he's just building a town. Basically, yeah. <laughs> he, he started posting pictures of, hey, I built this building. Hey, I built that building. And then next thing you know, he's like, hey, here I have half a French town. Okay, cool. We're, we're excited to get to play on it someday. All right. And where can people find you? Uh, what is, we just actually changed the name, so it's uh, Tidewater Warlord Gamers. Uh, it was originally just a bolt action page, but we changed it because we want to be inviting for all of Warlord's games. Because uh, I'm, I'm one of them who has basically all of Warlord games. I have, they have uh, many, many games ranging from uh, medieval fighting with knights and samurai, all the way up to the Revolutionary War, the Civil War, the Napoleonic War. And then they go into World War II, obviously. They have some futuristic stuff as well that goes way out into space with a lot of stuff that I don't understand. And um, they have a lot of naval games and planes and all kinds of crazy shenanigans that are just very fun to play. They're very simple rule sets, and Warlord is a great, great company to, to work with. They've been very fun. Awesome. So back to the Bruin. I'm so sore. <laughs> Sorry, it is for you that one. <laughs> my back stretches out. <laughs> That's her. Juice Back to the Bruin. So as the Bruin yeah. advances onto the board, uh, 
the some of the there's only one mech that actually gets the um, special rules for the Americans of the gyro stabilizers. So he will take a negative for moving onto the board. And I'm going to do exactly what I explained. So he's going to fire his main gun. I'm going to fire that over at the Merlin Walker. And then he's going to fire one of his rocket pods over at the infantry. Now the rocket pods are very powerful, so you're only able to fire one at a time because it's very powerful. So uh, let's see, he moved on the board, so that's a negative for that. It's a medium anti-tank gun, I believe. So that is a 60 inch range, and we will double check that in a second. And if it is a 60 inch range, I am just out of range for half range. Oh. So let's see, again, this is my first time using the Americans and I'm very excited. So it is a medium anti-tank gun with a 60 inch range. So with that, it means I'm going to have the same stats as the Merlin Walker did and I need a five to hit him. He has no cover and I just move and long range. So we will see if I can roll a five to hit the mech. No. Close, but no cigar. And then we will try and aim some of the rocket pods at the infantry over there. Now looking at the infantry from the Bruins perspective, I don't believe they're going to get any cover. Um, they're not quite far enough behind the bushes to get uh, light cover from that. And um, that's kind of what happens with beach invasions. It kind of stinks. Only for the aggressors. <laughs> True. So we will go ahead and try and fire again. Um, and. The rocket pods actually act as a heavy howitzer, which is a much, much uh, heavier um, explosion. So these are the arm-mounted rockets, and they have a longer range of 72 inches, so I will be in half range for those as Tanner is measuring now. So it'll be one shot. Uh, this one will just be on force because I only have the movement penalty. Let's see if I can get that floor again. That'd be nice. I get a four. So, uh, in this case, he unfortunately, uh, generally you can go down in response to an explosive, which is very helpful because, in this case, he's going to take a lot of hits. But because he already he already did run onto the board, he does not get a reaction. So unfortunately, he's just going to have to take the hit. And so, a heavy howitzer is the heaviest uh, HE weapon that any army can bring. And it is the four inch outside circle of this template, which comes in, uh, I, I'd have to double check the conflict starter box, but I believe it does come with one. If not, they have a separate sprue that uh, comes with it. So we'll put it over the guys and you have to maximize the most hits you can. So doing this, I believe I can get six guys with one shot. If I'm wrong, it was super heavy. There isn't a super heavy. Heavy house, right, right, heavy house, you're right there. Yeah. So it'll be those six guys right there, uh, and it'll, we'll roll for each individual guy inside that circle. So we'll roll six dice. And the heavy howitzer, uh, this is the old rules. So the heavy howitzer is 3d6 hits. As Again, as I said, it's a mixture of the old rules and the new rules. Now. We used the template, which we actually shouldn't have done when I just realized I looked at that, because Conflict technically does not have the template. That is a bolt action uh, thing that was meant to kind of more balance out the HE weapons as they were very, very powerful. And as you can see, with 3d6 hits on just a couple guys, more than likely it's going to kill quite a few. So the heavy HE, uh, let's see where it's penetration. Um, HE 3D6, so we go into the rule book and look and see. We have handy dandy little weapon charts on the back here. And 3D6 for the HE weapons. So it is a plus four penetration modifier. So at that point, what it means is anything but ones will kill those guys. So we'll roll 3D6 dice to get the hits. So that is eight, ten hits. And so we'll roll ten dice to see if I can wound him on anything but ones. I think that's going to hurt. 
You've seen Saving Private Ryan. That's what's about to occur here. Oh, jeez. Oh, I love the power of post. Oh, gosh. I forgot they didn't have the template. That's okay. I can also cut that out if I'm able to move around it. Well, I think that's okay to leave it in there. Mm. Uh, to explain that it is a little bit different than bolt action, it still has some of the older rule sets. Yeah. Um, so some people, I know some people don't like those older rule sets, so they don't like it and get into it. Now, again, like I said, we're lenient if yeah. somebody wants to use the templates. Obviously, we are used to using the templates. So. I would rather use the templates. Yeah. <laughs> but just as the demo, with that yeah. being the set and stone rules. Yeah. House rules. <laughs> right, right. We have house rules, but for demo's sake. We don't like to input those house rules in the community for everybody. Yeah. We just like to do that for like us playing together. Mm -hmm. Just a person to person basis. We'll yeah. that. All right, so 10, ten hits. Okay, so many dice. So uh, one missed. So that is, uh, let's see, five, nine hits on a, how big of a squad is that? Nine dudes. So it kills the entire squad with one Beautiful American made heavy rocket. Just a dummy rocket, because we're just training. That's the. Uh, mm. ignore, ignore the color the water is turning. Ignore that. <laughs> That's not real. That's ketchup. They're dying. Don't worry. Who's next? More Americans. Americans again. So I again don't want to do anything because they don't quite have any targets yet. Let's see. I'm going to try and bring my medic on the board. Medic. Now medics are an interesting uh, dynamic. Uh, they are considered non-combatants. They cannot hold objectives, and they cannot be attacked. Um, well, they can be assaulted in melee. Uh, it's basically seen as they're capturing them. But otherwise, they are not allowed to take objectives. They are not allowed to attack individuals. They, they're just there to try and save lives. We will run him up here to support his lieutenant. And it'll be the next dice. Aussies? No. Oh. It is Americans again. Americans. This is how it goes. This is how it goes. This, this is generally how it goes. Capitalism, right? <laughs> I've got to make sure my dice are in there sometimes. So, I don't quite want to bring any of the Tesla or heavy units onto the field yet, as he hasn't brought anything onto the board. So, what I'll try to do is I'll try to place uh, this infantry squad in this building in ambush. Now, as they have a pin marker on them, they'll have to try and test to see if they can pass the order. And when you test, you roll two dice. Each unit has a morale value. As they're veterans, they have a mor the highest morale value of 10. So I have to roll a 10 or lower. But because they have a pen, makes it a 9. Now generally, the officer being so close would probably provide them with a bonus. But because he's outside the building, they're too deaf, they can't hear him inside, so they don't get the bonus. So they'll have to get a nine or lower with two dice to be able to pass the order. And they do. So they roll a seven, so the pen marker goes away, and they are placed on English. And then it's the next die. Next die. Awesome. Aha! Woo! Finally. All right. Let's see if you just put them on hand for sets. So what does being in ambush do to make the poor Aussies nervous? So ambush means um, basically that takes their entire turn. And if someone advances or runs in, in their sight line, they're able to fire with impunity, basically. So I would call the ambush at the most opportune time. So if he's running between cover, I would call it at that point when I see him to take the shot. So if anybody runs in front of these windows over here, I'll get a shot at them. So that kind of eliminates that area. If he wants to come onto the board, he'll have to take fire, or he can come onto the board somewhere else. That's a nice little kill zone. Which is exactly what I'm doing. 
I placed my dark my die right here just so I can kind of mark where I'm bringing my guys on it that they're going to be running on. So same as last time, and then kind of run on almost like they're coming out of the Higgins here. Next eye. Let's see again. So I'm actually going to run another unit. Let me run my sniper team on the board. And as they're close together, this brings up a good example of unit cohesion. They have to remain an inch apart, just so it's easy to tell that they're two separate units. Even though they have two separate dice that can get, you know, clearly they're the same texture, they're the same color, everything. It's to help make sure that you don't intermix units and get them confused with one another. With that, next eye. Watch again. And as you can see, because most of mine were coming out in a row, he has a lot more dice as I only have uh, one, two, three dice left in the back. And he has quite a few left. So for my next one, I'm actually going to have, I'm going to have my artillery observer run on. That's right. I'm very edge of the board here. Yeah. All right. I'm going to have my little bombardier advance on. Happy angry turtle. That's the turtle man. Now remember not to block sight lines so he can get a shot. Mm. There you go. Yeah, I guess they are track vehicles, so they right. well track vehicles get in line, right? Or are they a little bit different? They still classify as a walker. They do? They do. Very nice. The British have a very unique automated infantry, so basically AI uh, robots that look like IG-88 with British helmets. It is quite hilarious. And they are quite terrifying. So we got little mushroom bots of death? Yes. Every unit has, every nation has its own unique cool things. The Germans go more into the occult side. They have vampires, they have werewolves, they have zombies, they have all kinds of crazy mechs and machinations, and um, the Americans are very heavy into their walkers and their Tesla. Uh, they also have jetpack troopers. Uh, everybody has power armor troopers. They're all different for each nation. Uh, so they all play differently. How I play the American heavy infantry is completely different from how I play the German heavy infantry. Um, and uh, yeah, it's, it's really fun to see all of the different ideas that they came up with. Um, the Japanese have all kinds of crazy, crazy tanks and mechs, and they have shockwave guns, and it's really cool. It's now really this, cool. Is, uh, this is something I did kind of forget to kind of caveat onto that. Uh, since this is a unit that I've not used it before, but as Scott's mentioned, the, the British actually have these kind of walking, almost Terminator robots, and it's actually included in the starter kit, uh, that are carrying uh, medium machine guns or heavy machine guns, and they're, they're, they're automated and they're called automatons, and they have specific rules. So even though right now I don't have to roll to have anything from morale or anything to come onto the board, but then to do any kind of order, I still have to roll from morale, or they just don't list them. They short out or anything. They have a basic decision-making ability, but lack quick reactions and true human judgment. They have multiple such rules to follow, but they still follow state of morale, which they're not gonna come on. So it does, uh, in typical Tanner fashion, um, with no pins or nothing really negative affecting him, he still doesn't pass the test. That does happen. It's very unfortunate. It, it stinks, but it's, uh, it's an unfortunate thing of real life that happens sometimes too. Troops just don't want to obey orders. And they're also really bad robots, so I mean, it's really the British's fault. Dude. I blame the Commonwealth. Yes. All right. So what do we have? I still have my heavy infantry and my Tesla scout car. Hmm. What to run, what to run. I think we're gonna have to use the scout car. Or, actually, 
I can do what a common tactic um, that's, that's used quite a bit. When you don't quite want to bring in your units yet, what you can do is say, my officer, who's not going to move, he's in a great position, he doesn't need to move. Um, actually, he probably does need to move because that sniper can probably shoot him now. So what I'll actually do instead of, I was planning to go down, but I will just actually scoop him back a little bit so that sniper doesn't get a shot on him. And so you can change where the dice go? Uh, well, I didn't actually, ass I, because I didn't actually assign it to him and put him on the board, uh, I hadn't technically decided which unit I was going to bring on the board yet. And I actually forgot I still had him over there, because, I mean, how could I forget that, though? He looks so awesome. I mean, just look at him. Look at the base. Star Spangled Banner. Star Spangled Base. It's so nice. <laughs> so, because it's just a, a couple inches, we don't really need to measure it. Uh, we're very, very good about that, again, with the, you know, just the community. You know, just moving a couple inches, it's not... No skin off anyone's nose. We're all just here to have fun. Fun time. Where's my thumb? There it is. Yeah, fist bump. Perfect size? Yes. All right. Australians. All right. All right, let's hop to it. Yeah. Aha! Into the meat grinder. Oof. <laughs> I'm still kind of not going to hit into them. I might just go for it. I'm going to go ahead and run on a squad. Where's the paper on you? So what Tanner is doing is he's, he's risking getting shot at by the ambushing unit, but he knows because they're on a window, they only have one guy firing because the other has an SMG. So he's not really going to be in range. So he's taking that risk of at least taking a ping and maybe two wounds, but it's it's very unlikely. So he's running the risk assessment of, I'm probably going to get shot, but it's probably not going to be too bad if I do. So with them moving in front of the window, there's a 45-degree arc from the building. So uh, it's, it's from the building itself. It's kind of weird how it does that. Um, so basically, the only guy that's going to get to shoot is the bar sitting right here in the window because he has a longer range than the other SMG that was put on the window. So we'll measure from the bar for a 30 inch range. So he's going to be at long range. He didn't move or any other negatives, so he's just going to be hitting on fours. So he's got two shots again, and he hits twice. So it was a risk, but even, even if I do wound him, it's not going to be very much. It's only going to be two guys, but that is kind of cool. And they're pinned now, right? Correct. But since they already did their order, that's not going to affect them until next turn. And see if we wound, we get one wound. So all in all, he does take a casualty, he does take a pin. But it could have been a lot worse if I had had, say, another LMG over there, or rifles firing out the window. I'll see. That's from your trap. I need my Australian officer, my second one's to come on. And he's also just going fancy to blue shirt. His fancy blue shirt. He is the aqua officer. I remember the one inch cohesion. Just so he's back just far enough yeah. so we know he's a different guy. If he's fancy enough in the blue shirt, we're not gonna we're not gonna stress it too much. Right. That's pretty close. And it's mostly uh, unit cohesion is a nice thing, but say I try to hit that unit with a another heavy rocket. If he's too close, it might hit him too. So that's another thing that justifies spacing. Ah, oh, Americans. Oh, Americans. So as everything on the board has already gone and activated, I have to bring on my last few units. So we will bring on, I think there's enough infantry to try and bring on the Tesla. So he is a wheeled vehicle, so he moves a little bit faster than everybody else. Even on an advanced order, he goes a little bit. It's uh, actually no, I think they're the same as the walkers. They're 12 inches, but they are a 24 inch run instead of an 18 inch run of the walkers. So you have this adorable little scout car here, and he's going to advance up the board. Nice, solid 12 inches. Now the Tesla gun is a it's a very unique weapon that actually has uh, unfortunately has a very short range. So I might not be in range to actually do anything to him. So the turret mounted light Tesla cannon is 30 inches. So I may actually be in close. I thought it was a little bit shorter. 
So we'll see if I am within 30 inches, which it looks like I am. You are. Now, I believe he is going to get light cover. The electricity, while well, it can just go through the bushes, it's simulating that it's harder to see him through the bushes. So the effect, the issues I'm going to have, it's going to be a lot harder shot. So I moved and I'm trying to shoot through cover at long range. So that means I'm going to have to hit him with sixes, which is going to be a lot harder to actually hit him. So with the Tesla cannon, it fires one shot. And then the special effect comes into play if I'm actually able to hit with that shot. So let's see if I can get hit on a six. Nope, it was a three. So that's his turn. He tried, but he just made a nice sparkly little light show. He has announced his presence. He has. Next beat, Aussie's again. All right. And I'm going to run up with my other smaller squads, my veteran flamethrower squad. It's going to be them. Americans. The last dice will be me. So all that is left for my Americans is my heavy infantry. My heavy infantry uh, is a little harder to kill them, and they all have assault rifles. But we'll see how they do as their first time out. And Americans are very unique with their uh, powered armor infantry. Uh, generally, everybody else is, is quite slow. It's big, clunky not very easy to move around in. The Americans, however, have streamlined it. Very nice, very efficient, very smooth, air conditioned, and it moves at a normal pace of infantry. Uh, now the Japanese are very unique in that they're the only ones who are fast. They actually move faster than the normal infantry, which is pretty terrifying when you think about it. So we'll go ahead and run these guys on the board up the middle because they're armored. I have a feeling they'll do a little bit better than regular infantry out in the open. So they get to run their normal 12 inches. I'll run off there as a squad. And that is their entire turn. And so the dice reset? Uh, Tanner still has oh. two units to go. So because I no longer have any units, he is just going to get to move those two units as he pleases with no resistance. Unfortunately. Bombardier is not going to be going on because he rejected my orders. But I will get my last entry squad on. Skynet kicked in and he didn't want to follow orders. Thanks. All right, so I will have them actually run on the board over here. But the threat is gone. You're no longer in the ambush. Uh, right it's a very common tactic to what Tanner does. Uh, you know, he measures, it, measures the distance and places the dice there so he knows how far he can move up. Makes it a little simpler to move up the entire squad instead of having to measure each and every guy. And you'll find those shortcuts and we're very, you'll find the theme of we're very chill and just about having fun. And then that would be it. Now we would do the dice back and back. What about, oh, those are the casualties. Yes. Okay. Okay, so everything will go back inside the bag and the turn will reset. Um, as he had those casualties, that dice came out of the bag and that's a victory point for me. Per unit? Yes. Nice. Now he gets, uh, I believe you get two points per casualty of mine. All right. So normally we, we just swap sides for dice pull. Just, just in fairness, because, you know. Ooh, where's the left? Airstrike. The airstrike. The airstrike. The airstrike and artillery barrages are the first thing to always happen if you called them in the previous turn. So before anybody goes, anybody does anything, you see if the artillery or the airplanes come in or not. So for these, there is a special rule. It's usually in the headquarters section. Let's see where the headquarters section is located in the book. Amongst all the things. 75. Actually, I think it's. Airstrike resolution. Okay. So we have an airstrike chart. So we roll a d6 and we see 
If it's a rookie pilot, which is very unfortunate for me if I roll a one because then Tanner gets to change the target to any one of my units. Basically, he's a terrible pilot and he thinks he's shooting at the enemy, but he's actually shooting at me. If I roll a two or a three, it means he's just circling. He hasn't been able to find the target. There's clouds, however you want to explain it. And on a four or five or six, here it comes. And then if it does come in, we roll on a different chart to see what kind of plane is actually coming in. So let's first see it roll if it even comes in. Don't roll one. Come Thank in. goodness it comes in. So we get the plane. And the plane is going to be coming in. Coming in hot for an airstrike. Right on top of the Merlin. So we're going to roll another D6. And we'll see if it's a strafing fighter, a fighter bomber, or a ground attack aircraft. Take this away so we don't get it mixed in. It is a ground attack aircraft. So that's one of the better, better options to get. So this is either a dive bomber or a fighter bomber equipped with rockets or heavy automatic cannons to attack armored targets. It is exactly what I needed to take out the Merlin. As I explained before, my demo games are a little bit crazy. I don't know why that always happens. It's really hilarious. Started with Tanner, funnily enough. It always happens. Everything always happens. So he will take three additional pin markers and three D6 hits with a four penetration value weapon. So he'll go ahead and take uh, three pin markers for him for the airstrike. I'll go ahead and roll the three D6 hits for 10 hits. And uh, as it's an airstrike, uh, vehicles, generally vehicles have different armor values. So it's very realistic in that sense of tanks have front armor that's their heaviest, a little bit sider, a little bit weaker on the sides, and then on the rear is the weakest armor so it's easier to penetrate. And not the same as the top armor, it's generally a lot weaker because you're not getting hit from the top by other tanks. So the sides matter? Yes, it does on vehicles. Mechs, however, because they're very unique, they get a special rule called armored all around. So you don't get any bonuses for hitting them anywhere else. So it's, because it's a lot easier, it's a lot more versatile vehicle, it's a lot easier to get rear shots. So they make it a little bit, a little bit easier because they're weaker than normal tanks. They're not as strong. Even the heavy walkers are still pretty weak. Um, now what's the armor value of the Merlin walker? So the Merlin is a nine plus. So it's a 9 plus, so I rolled for 10 hits, so let's see, 4, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10 hits. So it is a 4 plus penetration value weapon. And uh, it did not take any flak, so it does not remove anything like that. Now it does say armored targets are hit on their top armor, but that's referring to, again, tanks, uh, armored cars, things of that nature, not the walkers themselves. So with my penetration value of 4 and his armor value of 9, I need a 5 to glance off the armor, which is does damage but not quite enough damage for what I would like, or a 6 will penetrate the armor and do damage to the crew inside or destroy the vehicle. So it's a lot of hits and a lot of opportunities to get lucky. Let's see if it does. Good. You yes. got a 5 so it looks like it does uh, 3 times. And let's see, so this is a glancing shot. So what a glancing shot does is we now roll on a penetration chart. A lot of charts, a lot of math. If you're bad at math, it's not too bad. I'm terrible at math. Honestly, same, but I play magic all the same. <laughs> so here is the vehicle damage chart, and it's the same for every vehicle. So once you penetrate the vehicle, you have to roll to see what kind of damage you do to the vehicle. So with the five, we'll go ahead and see how bad the damage is for the walker. So I rolled a five. With a glancing shot, we subtract, uh, let's see, so it's called superficial damage right here. Roll a d6 minus three. So we minus three from the five, and that leaves us with a two, meaning it is immobilized. So it cannot move. It is stuck there. I broke its leg. So it can still fire, it can still do whatever it needs to do. However, if I immobilize it again, it's destroyed. 
So now we take the two sixes that are penetrating shots, and we'll roll to see if we can finish it off. So the four is going to go with knocked out. So that means the vehicle is destroyed and it's no longer serviceable. So that was for my first airstrike. That was pretty good. That was awesome. Yeah. That was pretty amazing. Good job, P40. Good job. Happy little plane. Look at him smiling. Big old teeth. So the Americans are very unique as they get a second airstrike. So that plane's done and I can call in the second airstrike if he does not get sniped, which I'm sure Tanner will do, because we're taking I'd, vengeance. I'd be, a little, I'd be a little upset with that too. Taking vengeance round the campfire, here we go. Taking vengeance round the campfire. You wanna pull the dice out for the walker? There you go. That works. So if a dice is in the bag and a unit dies, it just comes out of the bag. It's still Australians. The Aussies indeed come back with a vengeance. We, we will. We, we're going to give a shot. All right. Sniper is going to take a shot. A shot, huh? So snipers are very unique. Snipers, as long as they don't move, they can choose to just fire their scoped rifle. Their range is 36 inches, which is longer than a normal rifle as it's scoped. And they ignore all negative modifiers to hitting. So normally, he would be hitting at long range, in heavy cover, and I would be a single man, so that would make me an even harder target to hit. Now, because he's a sniper, he ignores all of that, unless he has pins or he's missing his spotter. So all he has to do to hit my guy is a three. And that's a hit. Now, the artillery observer, he is a regular, so he is wounded on a four. The Wounds still remain the same unless you have a special character such as Vasily Saitsev or some other snipers who are very cool, very cool stats. I kill him. Can you kill him? Sure can. He does. The forward observer is gone and he does not get the second airstrike and his dice comes out of the bag, unfortunately. And that is actually, I believe, two points for Tanner because yes. that was one of my original units trying to retreat. All right. So tit for tat. I'll take it. I'll take it. Nice. Only slightly. <laughs> All right, and for the next die, we have Australians. Hmm. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and fire my artillery observer. You can do something very similar. I'll take the smoke marker. And I'm going to place it right, right there. So then, like Scott's kind of do like the air observer, you place it on a unit, like I kind of mentioned earlier, you place it on a unit, it moves around with the unit. When you place an artillery marker, it stays stagnant in that position. Now, same thing with how the Air Force came in at the beginning of next turn before we pull any dice, that's how next turn the artillery marker will come in. Um, Artillery will, of course, how you kind of imagine artillery barrage comes in, it can hit a vast area, like very, very, very large area, and it can just knock out multiple units assigned. It's crazy amounts of damage and pins. And I, you know, when I'm placing this marker down, I can assume, okay, he's gonna have to move now. He's gonna have to move his units, so if he tries to shoot at me, he's gonna be at a penalty or a negative, unless he wants to try and brunt that artillery coming next turn. So this gives me a pretty broad spectrum of where I might be able to hit. Or well, the observer could have given the wrong uh, the wrong zip code, and it could go that way towards his own guys. It Ow. Happened before to mm -hmm. me. It's it's very rough. It is very plausible. Let's let's not jinx myself here. It is it is one of my demo games. It is. So, so it'll it probably happen after you shoot your own officer. Yeah. I smell sadness, with a grain of salt. It's hard to see with the mask, but. I'm <laughs> So, and with that observer, again, he fires, that's his entire thing. Now, he can, at this point, because he has no more artillery barrages, he didn't, he didn't buy enough care packages, um, he still has a rifle. He still counts as a man. He can still come up. He can still capture objectives. He can still be a threat. Just not as much of a threat. The Americans. So, at this point, I'm feeling pretty confident to move up with impunity, and I want to try and electrocute 
question, guys. Electro. Let's see if we can do it. All right, so because it's a wheeled vehicle, they get multiple turns. Uh, they can, they're, obviously, they're more maneuverable, but they are usually generally a lot weaker, unless you get the Puma, and everybody hates the Puma because it's just so good. All right, so we're going to advance up six inches, turn, and we're going to advance up just a few more inches right here, and we're going to try and zap. Uh, let's see, who should we try and zap? Now, there's no pre-measuring in this game, period. Uh, the only things you can pre-measure are uh, your officers have a command range that I previously mentioned just a little bit before. Uh, you can measure that uh, with a lieutenant at six inches, so at any point I can go, okay, who's within his command radius? Okay, basically just the medic because they're inside. So that's, uh, that's the only thing you can pre-measure besides Tiger Fear. Uh, but we don't have any German vehicles, so we won't go on the Tiger Fear. Um, so let's see, I will go ahead and try and shoot the guys directly in front of me out in the open. Those guys right there. So they are still long range. Probably should have scooted up a little bit more because I had the chance. But he's already moved, so we'll just go ahead and take the shot. So he's going to be moved and long range. All right, now with that, Tanner has the option if he wants to. It'll sacrifice that unit's turn, but he can go down to make that shot a lot more difficult. Tanner, would you like to go down? Yep, go ahead, fire away. Thunderbolts and lightning, very, very frightening. That's a hit. Of course it hits when I don't go down. <laughs> <laughs> so again, this is my first time using the Tesla, and it is very cool. It has uh, very special rules. So the Tesla weapon has two penetration values. The lower value is used against infantry and artillery. So artillery would be your howitzers, your anti-tank guns, they all kind of fit into the same clump. And so a different value against vehicles. It's not a vehicle, we're not going to worry about that. When targeting infantry or artillery, the weapon uh, arcs to nearby targets. So after a successful hit is rolled with the five, roll a d6, we'll roll another d6 here, for of course a six. And so with that, that means it arcs to six additional guys in the unit. Oh, gosh. Now, uh, so say you get more hits than there are units. It does not arc to any other units. It does not go anywhere else. It just dissipates there at the hit. So if they, had, if they didn't have more than seven guys, uh, it would just kind of disappear. But so that as a first time Tesla hit, again, first time using the Americans, Demo game, they're always crazy for me, and I love it. I know, I know Tanner is probably starting to hate doing demo games with me, but... Cannot confirm or deny. The it mask hurts. Helps. <laughs> it hurts. The mask does help. <laughs> so it says right here, if the number exceeds the number of models in the unit, any excess hits are lost. So it'll be seven hits total, and the Tesla gun... Because it's a light Tesla gun, it has a little bit less penetration. Um, let's see. So the Tesla, light Tesla cannon, uh, it would be a, let's see. So we did some calculations. Again, I'm bad at math. So the, uh, both the light and the heavy Tesla cannon are only a plus one penetration for infantry. So sometimes it just gives them a little static. Sometimes it makes their hair stand up. Sometimes it disintegrates them. So let's see if it does that. Uh, they are regular troopers. Correct. So with regular troopers plus one modifier, that is going to be a three to wound them. Let's see if they get electrocuted. Yeah. It looks like uh, a lot of them get electrocuted. However, we have a unique opportunity. For damage, we have sixes. So with these sixes, it's called exceptional damage. So when you roll to damage and you roll a six, you can roll another six to see if I get to pick the target that Tanner has to take away from his unit. Basically, the electricity was very on point and it decided who it wanted to go to. And is that only for the vehicles or just electric weapons? It's for every weapon. It's exceptional damage, so it's, it's a very unfortunate circumstances of the shrapnel just happened to go to the sergeant or the sniper picked out the sergeant. So it's, it's exceptional damage. It's one of those things that you don't get very often, and when you do, it's actually very cool. So it's a critical success. Basically. Nice. 
So we'll see if any of those, one of them is exceptional. So with one of them being exceptional, I can pick who I want him to take out of the squad. And I can only pick one guy because I only rolled one six for that. So let's see. So all together, it was one, two, three, four, five, six wounds. And what do you have in your squad, Tanner, that is good? So it is nine riflemen, including the NCO having a rifle, and then one LMG. So this is a unique opportunity for me. I have to decide whether I want to take away his firepower or his leadership. Now, taking away his leadership, taking away his NCO, he will always be at a negative uh, from when he has to do order tests. So it'll be a, he'll, his regular status of nine morale drops to an eight permanently until the entire squad is gone. Or I could take out his heavy firepower. Generally, you pick it based on the army you're fighting. Germans, you want to focus on their heavy machine guns, or they're just their machine guns, because that's where the German power lies, and they can easily replace their NCOs, so they're not a very viable target. Things like this, things like the Americans, it's kind of a tough choice, because they don't get to replace them. They don't, uh, they don't get that, and their machine guns aren't as powerful, so it's, it's a little bit tougher decision. I think I am going to go ahead and take away their NCO. Boop. So their NCO is going to go, and then he is going to lose five more guys on top of that. Now I'm at less than half the squad from one shot. Now when that happens, this is a, my demo games, ladies and gentlemen. Because I destroyed more than half the unit in one round of shooting, he has to check his morale. Now, being picking the way that I did, he now lost his NCO. So he is at a minus two because he got hit, so he has a pen marker, and he has a minus one for losing his NCO. So now he has to check his morale to see if his units flee the battlefield or if they stay and fight. Now Tesla does not give any bonus to pins, correct? Just the one? Tesla does not give any bonuses to pins. It is just the same regular one pin. Okay, so my first, or excuse me, my second lieutenant is within six inches of them, so they will get a plus one. With eight. an eight, and a minus two from the nine, and a plus one from the lieutenant, he just barely stays on the border. Just barely. As long as it equals your morale value or lower, he passes. So he still takes severe casualties, but they're going to stay in the fight, and they're still a threat to me. Go ahead and pull okay. Next dice. It is another American dice. It's not looking so good for the Aussies. Take heavy casualties. As with just about any beach landing, it's bound to happen. It kind of kind of stinks. So now my options are: I wanted to try and push forward and get him a little bit on the defensive with my units that are coming onto the board, because my guys that were on the board, my objective is to get them out. They're tired. They need a break. They need some coffee. So we need to get them out of there. Now I have to decide: Do I want to press him further? and try and get those guys out of there. Risking them getting penned, maybe not passing their orders, and maybe not getting out, or do I want to just keep laying down the hurt on this uh, beach invasion? So, I think with what I have coming onto the board that's gonna stay on the board, it's very powerful. Um, I'm very lucky that I took out his, uh, his big, heavy anti-tank. He still has a bombardier, which I actually don't know what it has, so we'll see if it's good enough to take out the the Bruin or the scout card. Well, I think I got the scout card. So if it decides to follow orders and come on board. Fair point. So with that, I think I'm going to try and start getting some of these guys out of here. So what we're going to do because there are more guys over here and these guys are more likely to get uh, taken down. I actually kind of want to leave them because they're really the only threat to these guys at this point. There's not a lot going on over here, even though this is my stronger squad. They got lucky, got some kills. So what they're going to do is they're going to try and pull back. So I'm actually going to advance them back, because if I advance, I'm still retreating, and I could possibly get a shot on the retreat. So let's see if I can do that.
Now units have cohesion where they are able to fire through their own models. So Joe shoots, knows not to shoot Bob in the back sometimes. And he knows to shoot around them. They know how to move as a cohesive unit and avoid each other's shots. So we can still move around and hopefully get a few shots. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and put the pressure on those guys that I just zapped. We're going to see if we can get some shots. Now this is going to be, more than likely, this is going to be an impossible shot. So we'll get to see how impossible shots work. So I moved, but Americans generally don't get a negative. That's their special rule. Their rifles and their bars ignore the move and shoot penalty. Thank you, Tanner. As their, it's, it's their special rule, the M1 Garand was, it was a semi-automatic rifle, which was much better than everybody else's bolt action rifle that they had at the time. So it makes sense that they're able to shoot and move. So we'll see if anybody is in range of that squad. So all of my rifles are outside of range. Every single rifle for every single nation is the exact same 24 inches. Now it does look like my bar is in range and my LMG is in range. So they will still get to shoot, basically the same as last time, except they're going to be a little bit different. So the LMG is still going to be firing four, the bar is still going to be firing two. Now the LMG will do his stats first. So he moved, he's having to fire through light cover, through the bushes, and he's at long range. The bar only has long range and the light cover. So his shot's going to be a little bit easier because he's able to move and fire which makes sense with a light machine gun, it's a little bit harder. So the machine gun is going to be hitting on sixes, the bar is going to be hitting on fives. Let's see if they can get it. It looks like the machine gun did not hit, so the shots go wild into the water. Let's see if the bar can pull off a hit. Looks like the bar can pull off a hit. He's on fire today, that's the second hit, isn't it? Oh yeah. Now let's see if he can wound him. There's still the same wound. Uh, there's no penetration with this weapon, so they'll be wounding on a 4+. plus. That's another wound. So because I've hit him with two different weapons from two different groups, he now has two pin markers on top of the attack. So it's going to be a negative 3 for him to do his order check. All right, and we'll go to the next die. And it's the Australians. Oh, finally. <laughs> okay, well, we will, we will attempt to see if Mr. Bombardier will come on to the board. Please come on. What's his morale value? Nine. So Nine. He's, so he's on board? He is a regular. He's coming on. So he's going to advance on. Oh, boy. He will advance on. This could be rough. Oh. And he is going to fire, which again, this is a, a new unit that I have not used before. Now you only have to check, as far as I understand it, Tanner, correct me if I'm wrong, you only have to check for those automated units to pass the order. You don't have to do any other checks for them to fire or anything like that. Right, right. No matter what, if they have any pin markers, I still have to roll every time for them to pass. And they don't take any benefits from officers. Um, I also think they don't take pin markers. No, they do take pin markers. But it has a different effect on them because they're terminators. I don't care. Terminators. Terminators. And they also move and fire without suffering the minus one to hit. So, with my little robotic man over here driving on his little wheels, even though he advanced up the board, he is a walker or an automated. Excuse me. He can move and shoot, and I'm designated to shoot at the scout car with his light howitzer. It will be within half range. So, moved. Doesn't take the penalty. Within half. So, twos, correct? Not uh, threes. Threes. Correct, yeah. And then yeah. Yeah. positives. So, positives. Yeah, right, right. So, just three to hit. And I will be aiming, hitting, and front armor. So, let's see. Me three. That's it's it. The front armor of the scout car is the lightest armor available in the game. So, uh, soft skin vehicles, uh, trucks, Jeeps, they're all sixes for their armor value. So regular small arms fire from rifles can kill them on sixes. They don't have to roll on a damage chart because it's, it's just a truck, let's be honest. Back then, they weren't very, weren't very armored. But 
The scout car is a seven, same thing with uh, transports and things of that nature. It's the lightest armored uh, available, which is seven. So his light howitzer has a penetration value of two. So with my armor value of seven, he needs a five to glance or a six to penetrate. So I'm good, so I'm good. That's a glance. Glances. What was it? It's five. five. So it glances off the armor. So he rolls on the same damage chart we rolled for the Merlin. And uh, he rolls that minus three. So minus three. Unfortunately, that means the Tesla vehicle is on fire. So when a vehicle is on fire, they have to check their morale or they run away. Which, to be honest, I'd run away from a flaming Tesla vehicle too. Regular Tesla stuff. Awesome. Some frightening. Terrifying looking. So let's see. Uh, let's go to the chart uh, to make sure that we're doing everything correctly. So, on a three, it is on fire. The hit ignites after the vehicle's fuel or ammunition, which is kind of weird when you think about it because it's just electricity. But, so the crew is driven to panic, so they get uh, one pin in addition to being shot. So they get the pin for taking the hit, and they get another pin for being set on fire. Because that kind of stinks. As well as the D2 pins. As well as the D2 pins from the HE weapon. And we'll be one, it'll be one more pin, so it'll put me up to three pins. Now, if he had fired that indirect, that could have hit my top armor, which would have been a negative, but it would have been harder to hit. So he did hit on the front armor, and he glanced. So with it on fire, I have to do a morale check, and let's see if they pass their morale. They are regular. So they have a morale value of nine minus three. three pins. So I need a six or lower, or they abandon the vehicle. They abandon the vehicle. So the vehicle goes up in a ball of flame, and they run away terrified. Can the Americans hold the beach? Let's see if they can. Speaking of Americans. So let's see what options we have. So as my reinforcement's coming on, these guys can move up. So let's see. So they're trying to stay on the board and hold the beach for these guys to run away. So we're going to advance. Sorry, they're not running away. They're advancing in a different direction. So let's go ahead and walk up here with my walker. I'm just going to go a nice, nice little eight inches there. We're going to get a little bit brave, and we're going to go ahead and fire the pedal mount. Now, what happens when you fire a pedal mount button on a vehicle? You have closed vehicles, and you have open-topped vehicles. Your open-topped vehicles are your transports. Uh, many of the uh, anti-tank platforms that they had of the day were open-top. They didn't have any top armor. When that happens, they can take pins from small arms fire. Normally, if he shoots at me, they would just bounce off and they wouldn't care but he can add pins to me until the end of the turn as an open top vehicle. But it gives me an extra weapon with the beautiful 50 count, so why not? So because that's a different weapon system, I can again split it. So he has three different weapon systems I can choose to attack three different targets. So let's go ahead and try and fire. What's the armor value of the Bombardier? So Bombardier is a six plus. Six plus. So let's fire the 50 cal at the bombardier. We'll fire the uh, anti-tank gun. Hmm. Let's fire the anti-tank gun at the flamethrower team, just in case. And we'll fire the right rocket pod this time over into. Um, hmm. Let's go with that squad right there. So we'll do them each separately. We'll do the 50 caliber first. So the 50 caliber is going to take shots at the bombardier. He's going to be at uh, the 50 cal is 36. All the machine guns are 36 uh, inches for their range. So is he within half? Looks like he's about. So if you're going for like the gun itself, like just the barrel of the gun. This is the chassis. The chassis. chassis. You're exactly at 18. Okay. So he did move. He doesn't have gyro stabilizer, so he will take the negative for movement. Now, I will leave it, uh, as this is a community thing, I will leave it to Tanner to declare whether he will get cover from those bushes or not. 
from the weapon system. If there's anything bigger, I say it wouldn't, but with how small it is, it's really hard to tell. I'm gonna say it doesn't. Doesn't get you're, it. You're kind of above it, so you can kind of aim down. Yeah, any other weapon, I'd say like the front gun might. But yeah, everything else would, but yep, no, it does not. Okay, so we will go ahead and fire the 50 caliber machine gun at him. So it'll be a minus one for movement, and that'll be all. So I'll just need force to hit. Looks like I got one hit. Now it has a penetration value of one. It has an armor value of six, so that means I need a five to damage it. It does not damage it. However, it will take pens. Don't know what effect that has on Terminator, but we'll see. So it does have a special rule with being a Terminator. Uh, it's a tough vehicle, which is only for the front arc. A vehicle with a tough special rule rolls a d6 every time an opponent rolls equal or over its damage value from hits from the front arc only. The damage is ignored and I rolled a 5 plus. Okay, so because I didn't do any damage, that doesn't do anything. Correct. It'll only be if I penetrated the armor. Um, yeah, so I'm always going to change the stuff. I think I'll screw you against the pen. Yeah, I think pens work the same, honestly. For walkers, yeah. Yeah, this one little dude has so many rules. I believe that's it. Automaton. Uh, cannot be given assault or ambush orders. They cannot carry out reactions. Mm -hmm. Must make an order test on every receive an order. Uh, they are immune to horror and they cannot benefit from national special rules. Yep, just like every turn. So it doesn't mention anything about pen markers, so I take that to assume pen markers just act the same. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. That seems to make sense. Okay. Um, your so, cannon onto the flamethrower team. Alright, so the cannon moved, uh, should be within half. Uh, as we just measured it for the uh, the HMG, which is 18 inches half range, the medium anti-tank gun is 60 inches, so we know they're going to be within half. So this time it will get light cover? It will get light cover, and, and they squad. are a small squad. Small squads take another negative one because it's less men you're shooting at. If I'm shooting at a squad of 20 guys, even if I miss the guy I'm aiming at, I'm more than likely going to hit one of the guys in the squad. But with so few men in the squad, it's much harder to hit them. So because I moved, they get light cover, and they are a small squad, so I'm only hitting on a six. Let's see if I can get it. Nope, close, but no cigar with a five. And now we will go ahead and see if the rocket can hit twice. So again, it's a move. We know the range uh, is basically the same thing from the targets. So it is a longer range than the medium anti-tank gun. And we know because the medium anti-tank gun was with an F, we still want to measure it just to be fair. And the, anti the uh, heavy howitzer rockets will go ahead and fire. So it'll be a move, and that's it. So it'll be a four. That's a hit. So it is 3d6 hits. He can choose to go down to have the hits after I roll the hits if he wants to. But that means that unit cannot advance any further. So he actually got a little bit lucky. I didn't get that great a hit. Um, so I only got eight hits. I say only eight, it's still a lot. So I get eight hits, he can go down to have it to four if he wants to. They are gonna go down. Okay, so a dice will come out of the bag for the unit and he will go down in response to the hits. So I will only get to roll four die to see if I can wound him. So let's see if I can go ahead and get some wounds with plus four uh, modifier again. So it's gonna be uh, they're still regulars, correct? Correct. So anything but ones. So I did get a one, so that does nothing. And then we have three hits. So he's going to lose three guys, 
and they will take D6 pin markers for three pin markers, additionally to being hit. And how do you show how many pin markers are on a unit? Glad you asked, because I did not realize this after just getting into the game. Uh, when you buy one of the, some of the new starter kits, especially for both action and conflict, they sometimes include these sprues of these pin markers. And you can use one pin marker and they have a dial. And they go all the way up to 12. 10, yeah, 10 or 12. All up to 12. So there's a little predominant little protrusion at the very bottom of like the explosion marker, whatever they're marking. And they're all numbered. And they just, all you do is you clip them off their sprue and you just slot them in right to the bottom and then they rotate freely. Now sometimes they're hard to see. Uh, some people have painted them. Uh, I, I put minimal effort into try and paint mine so they're a little bit more visible when you look at the, the numbers. Uh, it's not much, but it's enough for me. Um, yeah, focus. So if it's not able to do it, what you can do is you can just stack multiple pin markers on a unit if you're, if you're more comfortable with that. It's perfectly okay. They come with a lot of pin markers, so it's easy to do that. All right, so that's a hit. They take all their pins, and they're now down. Their turn is done. So while I did, wasn't able to knock out the whole squad, I did pin them very badly with damaging fire, and now they're done. Australians. Okay. So with this, I'm going to go ahead and I will advance my squad, full squad, over over here. And they are going to fire at the squad in the building. Just give it a shot. We'll give it a go. So everyone in this squad has rifles as well as one LMG. So the LMG will be within half. Now Tanner, the British have very unique special rules that they sometimes translate to their Commonwealth units. Did you select a special rule for your national trait? I'm glad you said that. So I did. Like Scott mentioned, there's like seven, six or seven different rules you can choose from. There's quite a lot for the British and the Commonwealth. Uh, mine, actually, let me... The British are very versatile. They get to select one from a list of quite a few. They get, to, they get to pick which one they want. So the one that I chose was rapid fire. That's why my army is just full of riflemen. Uh, if the army has a special rule, then all riflemen, armed, regular, and better infantry units roll bonus dice when shooting. For every three men shooting rifles, roll one extra die. So on and so forth. These extra shots can be soon come from any of the men fighting. So this is a full squad. It's nine rifles, one LMG. So instead of shooting nine rifles, I'm going to be shooting 12. So I'm going to roll our rifles first, and then we'll get to the LMGs. Six. Six. All right. So I'm going to be at quite a disadvantage, though. They're pretty much going to be impossible shots because they're in a building, they're on hardcover. Uh, I moved, I'm shooting at long range. So that is impossible. Yes. So this, this will give you the example of impossible shots. So we'll get to see. So he actually did very good there. For impossible shots, to even hit the target, you need to roll sixes, followed by sixes. So he has four potential hits there. If he rolls another six, he gets a hit. He gets a hit. And with that one, they are veterans, so he needs a uh, five to wound. Does not. Does not wound, but it does add a pin marker, which we have seen, they can fail on one pin marker. And then last but certainly not least, I have my LMG. Under Scott's LMG, I'm used to playing German units and having that bonus, which I don't have. Now, the LMG is with a half range, but they're still in building, so I just should need... Be, you should be four shots. Four shots for the LMG? Yeah, four right? shots for the LMG. Oh, you're correct. Yeah, yeah. So it was within half, uh, moved, so up to four, hardcover, sixes. So you got one hit. One hit. And again, needing a five to wound. He does get a wound. Now normally, if my medic was inside the building with him, he could help them. But again, same as the officer, because he's inside the building, he cannot assist them. So one of the guys goes. The same thing happens for transports. If there are units inside a transport and the officer is outside of the transport, he can't assist them in any way. 
All right, so we'll go with the next die. And it is Americans. I'm so used to saying Germans when I play. I almost said Germans. So let's see, um, since they've already gone, let's see if we can't get those guys out of there. So let's try and advance them out. So they do not get the officer's bonus as they are inside the building. And from their hits, they have one pin marker. With veterans, they will need a nine or less to pass. And it looks like they pass with a six. So they will go ahead and advance outside of the building, the back door and the side door here. And their advance is just a normal six inches. And now I do this advance again because I have a bar, so the bar can potentially get shots on some targets while they try and advance in a different direction. And because they passed their order test, the pen marker goes away. So let's see if the bar can get a lucky shot on that officer with his nice, pretty camouflage shirt in the water. So the bar has a 30 inch range. Oh, You're out. He's out of range. So because the shot was already called, he's at 30 inches, he's out of range. He does not fire. Well, he fires, but it, it's just an automatic miss. Next dice is Australians. Speaking of an officer, I am actually going to snap two with him. So basically the way how snap two works is I have a second lieutenant, which is basically the lowest form an officer you can get. Uh, you're required to take two infantry and a lieutenant, either being a first or second lieutenant, any platoon you make. Then you can have other officers that go up to a captain and a major and so on and so forth. Now, how high a veterancy that the lieutenant is, as in being a second or a first lieutenant, is how many other units you can snap to. Now, that is any unit within six inches of him that's not in, like, say, a building or inside of a vehicle, inside of a transport. But you could snap to the transport or vehicle itself. You couldn't snap to the units inside. So with this unit being within six inches, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to declare that I'm snapping to him and declaring his order. Scott's going to grab a new dice out of the bag, which I'm going to go ahead and just advance him. Snapping two is a great way to, um, a lot of my lists, I'll bring a captain, uh, especially for my German list. The captains, when they do a snap two order, they can snap to up to four different units. That's their special rule, they have special command rules. So that basically guarantees I could get almost an entire side of my board to activate all at once with no reaction from the enemy team. Now, obviously with the lieutenants, it's a lot less, but captains and majors, they cost a lot more. But you can see the usefulness of them being able to activate and move a lot of units and really sway the battlefield in your favor. And by costing more, you mean the point values, right? Correct. And so how would point values equate to what we see here? So point values, uh, generally what uh, we run with conflict is uh, we run it generally at about 2,000 points because a lot of the units for conflict are very expensive and they're very cool. We like to see those bigger walkers and those bigger mechs on the field with lots of units and lots of things going on. Because so many of them are so expensive, it's hard to get them on in smaller point games. So the more powerful a unit is, the bigger it is, the more armor it has, the better weapons, the more expensive it is. The Germans have a, a very heavy six-legged walker that looks amazing. It's called the Zeus. I actually have one here at Tower, I believe. Maybe? No, we have the King Tiger with the railgun. The, uh, what that does is... Um, I lost my train of thought. Point values. Yeah, point values. It is very expensive. It is, a, I believe it's over 600 points. Uh, if you want to bring a uh, regular, I believe it's something about 500 points. So to be able to get those cool units on the field and still have a lot of things there so people are more incentivized to bring them onto the table. Now you can certainly play at lower point values, you would just have less units on the board. And so this is a 1,000 point game? This is a 1,000 point game and you can see we're still able to bring a lot of cool, unique units to the table. All right, so with my snap two, I was doing over here, so I've declared this small three-man squad. It was only squad that he's within range of to actually snap to. 
I just want to get them moving. Uh, now I'm going to roll to see if they actually activate, they, if they actually listen, but they've got two pins on them. They're still within range of the second lieutenant after moving, so they, they are also the squad that lost their NCO. So they're automatically bumped down to an eight, bump back up because of the second lieutenant, and then bump back down two because of the two pins. So it's seven, seven. They do not pass. They do not pass. So they unfortunately go down. They've taken a lot of heavy fire. They don't want to push up the beach. They're scared. Which is quite understandable when you're having gigantic rockets fired at you, and they're hitting every time. I would have no doubt. They just can't get away from that boat. They also just got electrocuted, so. I guess you could say it was a shocking discovery. It was very shocking, because they were also standing in water. So that didn't go very well for them. I think the pun game is real. <laughs> Next ice. Yes. Yeah, because you only activated the one. And he's got he's not range. So it is the Americans. Americans. So what I have left is the Americans. I have my officer and I have my medic. I don't quite want to move them yet. I want to be able to further support my push to actually hold this ground. Now I've already lost some of my reinforcements and one of my reinforcements can't really do anything. So what I'm going to try and do is I'm going to try and swing these guys up around here and we'll get to see some of their fun rules. So we'll do an advance for them. They get the full movement because they are fueled with American muscle. And let's see what they can do. So they'll get to move their normal six inches. And each heavy armored unit for each faction has different weapons, different abilities, and different uses. Um, so the American heavy infantry, uh, while they are good, they can move pretty fast. They're not very versatile in the weapons department. All they have are assault rifles. So they may look like cool LMGs attached to their arms, but they're actually just counted as assault rifles. The assault rifles have very unique rules. So the assault rifles are an 18 inch range. We haven't quite got to that yet. So let's see if they're in range of these guys that just advanced up the beach. They are not. So unfortunately they advanced, but nothing's gonna happen because they're out of range. If they had been in range, Assault rifles fire two shots per assault rifle, and they also have a special rule called assault, which helps them in point blank combat, as well as meaning they ignore the move and shoot penalty. So assault applies to SMGs, assault rifles, shotguns, pistols. Um, so those are, those are your better weapons in close combat. Obviously they're fully automatic weapons, um, and they're, they just do a little bit better on the move. So with that, That'll be the next die, as they did not get to fire. And it's the Americans. So at this point, all I've got left are my officer and my medic. I'm going to try and keep my medic with these guys in case they take any fire. They can hopefully, he can hopefully help them out. So we'll go ahead and just advance him, and he'll scoot on back with that infantry squad. And they have unit cohesion again, uh, so it's understood that the medic is able to walk through a friendly squad. And it is the last one of the Americans, and then it will be Tanner after I move. So I will go ahead and I guess I'm going to have to move my officer at this point. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to try and move him in these trees back here, so hopefully I can get away from that sniper before he can get a shot. So I think I can actually make it off the table there. So he is going to do his full retreat. He will get off the board. So he evacuated. I get points for that as that was part of my objective, but I no longer have officer support on the field. And then it's Tanner's turn. Okay. So I'm gonna take my flame throw team and they are going to run. They're, we're going to say they're in cohesion, but they're not going to fit the bushes. The bush! They didn't bring the machete, so they can't quite clear out the brush for them. All right. And so what's the plan here for charging a mech with flamethrowers? Well, we'll get to that when we get to it. Hopefully it happens. Now, if it happens, that mech's probably dead. But we'll see. It's been I ceased. upset that they tried to sizzle him. So, let's see what we can do. Uh, 
that's in the PDF, the Walker Assaults. Yeah. But I don't think I want to do a Walker Assault because I have a lot of heavy weapons. So. Lots of big boys. Lots of big boys. So what we're going to try and do is we're going to try and advance. We're going to try and back up a little bit. Now because that artillery strike, I do have two pins. He is a, he's a regular. So with the two pins, no officer support around him, he needs a seven or less to be able to activate. Let's see if he can go. He does. Rolls two threes with a six. Now because he has two pins, he's still going to keep one. It only gets rid of one pin. So he's still going to have a, have a negative to shoot and a negative to his morale next turn. So, probably shouldn't have advanced because I still get that same point blank bonus, but I do kind of want to distance myself from that unit. So we're going to just back up a little bit here. And then what we're going to try and do, we're going to try and fire the 50 caliber machine gun at them. We're also going to try and fire the heavy... Uh, the, the anti-tank gun at the bombard and we're going to try and fire the howitzer missiles at the same squad we hit before. So with the movement that is going to be a minus one I'm also going to take a minus one for the pin marker and I'm going to take a minus one for them being a small squad. So it'll be three shots for the 50 caliber machine gun hitting on sixes. No hits. Very close but no hits. So then we will go ahead and try and fire the main gun at the bombard. So at this point, because of how far I moved back, I would say it does get the cover of the bushes. So uh, if he is within 30, it will be a six as well. So let's see. Yep, yep it will be a six as well. So it'll be uh, moved, pin marker, and light cover. Let's see if I can get any sixes. Why did I roll three dice? I don't know. <laughs> None of them were sixes though, so I'm not going to count it. All right, and we're going to go ahead and try and fire the howitzer at that squad. So it's going to be moved and a pin marker hitting on a five. First miss with the howitzer. That one pin marker's doing work. Awesome. So I am going to attempt to activate. We'll go ahead and we'll do the rifleman squad over here. We'll see if we'll advance. And I'll go ahead and take shots at your big boys over here. Okay. So the LMG is going to be within half, but everything else is just out of half. So, long range, move. So my rifles are going to be fives. So again, same natural rule applies. This squad hasn't lost anybody yet. So fives on the right. Looks like three. Three that time. And they are veteran, but being armored, they have anything else. They have, uh, so e again, each individual power armored unit has different abilities. So the ability for the US heavy armored is they are wounded on sixes only, unless they're in hand-to-hand -hand combat. So he needs sixes to wound. Six as it is. Looks like he gets one. Now, again, because it is a six, he gets a chance to roll that six again and see if it's exceptional. It's not. So just one guy goes down. And then my LMG. And they will add another pin because it is a separate hit. Now my LMG is going to be hitting on fours because all it is he's moving. One more. Another six. Sixes. No. No. All right, next die. Again. So now we'll see about doing the bombard. Who 
see if I can just fire him. Let's see if he'll actually. I got one pin on. Up to nine. He'll be good. Go to last one. Yeah. Yeah. Up to nine. There you go. Go ahead and do the heavy howitzer. Heavy howitzer. Oh man. Light howitzer. Light howitzer. <laughs> Got an upgrade we didn't hear about. Right? It's so fancy. Gosh. We'll go ahead and fire at the guys that are way on the other side of the board. So they get light cover and long range. So we need fives. It hits. Oh boy. Light howitzer, I believe, is 1d6. Okay, yeah, that's kind of weird. It doesn't say it on there. Three shots, three hits. And the light howitzer is what penetration? It is just a plus one. Yep, just plus one pen. So four is the wound. One, one wound. Now, generally, they take a wound. The medic could help them, but the medic cannot help with HE weapons. And that'll be kind of hard to help when you're blown apart. Do what? Three pins. Three pins? No? Huh? Should be decent. D3? For a White Houser? Yeah, HE D3, right? Are you that wrong, or is it just the pin one? Just the one pin. That's okay. Better than nothing. And they did take a casualty, so that always sucks. Yeah. Oh. Getting spicy. It is. That it is. My lieutenant is going to go ahead and snap two. Get the dice out of the bag. And he is going to, he's going to go ahead and advance. I went the wrong direction with him. I'm going to rotate him over this way a bit. Right. He doesn't have range. He has an SMG, he has range of nothing. So now, my other order, I'm going to get assigned to my snipers. And they're going to fire on the guys out in the open. They're well within range. See you at three. Kangaroos. Need a five to wound. No, it does not wound. They would take a pen. And let it be known as well that medics cannot help with this exceptional damage. If your head's gone, they can't really bring it back. Americans. All right, so let's see if we can get some retaliation as the Americans see they're kind of losing the beachhead. So let's see what we can do. So let's go ahead and advance a little bit with these guys. They can pass their order test. They have three pins. They are veterans. 
So let's see if they can pass on a seven or less. They do not. Ooh. They just rolled what's called a foobar. So foobar is really bad. It basically means that uh, I roll on a chart now, by the charts again, and uh, depending on what I roll, I can have the potential for friendly fire, which at this point is not a concern um, because a friendly unit has to be close to an enemy unit for it to be mistaken as an enemy unit. Um, so I will roll on the chart and see, let's see what happens. So on the FUBAR chart, roll a four. So a four is a panic. It basically means they execute a run order to move away from the closest possible enemy, which is the flamethrower unit. So they will run their full 12, and they cannot run off the board, uh, so they will just run to the back of the board. And then they will just go down. And they retain all of their pin markers. So it looks like the Americans probably are going to lose the beachhead. Nice dies. All right. So these guys, I'm actually going to assign them a rally order. So then with that, rallies you don't need to roll morale, correct? Correct. You, Correct. Well, you still have to roll your morale, but you roll without any negative modifier. Without a negative modifier, right. So they would be fine, barely. What's their, their regular, so their regular morale is nine. Yeah. Yeah. So they would barely pass morale without their pins. Now I'd roll a d6 and, and add a plus one. D6. To it. I thought it was just d6 pin. Or is it d6 plus one? d6 plus one. d6 plus one. So it's d6 plus one to remove morale. <laughs> remove all my pins. Easily removed all of them. But that's now their turn. They don't do anything else. They stay there. They hip hip parade. They're ready to go again. The next dice. Yeah. What do I have left? Uh, you have your observer. Yeah. And you have the squad in front of the Higgins. And then you have the. That's it. I think my brow or is way out there now. Yeah, he's out of range for that. So I'm going to go and run my forward observer. Why not? That's it. Next die. Americans. U.S. Okay. Of eight. So I'm going to try and activate these guys over here, and they're going to try and advance. Now they do have the uh, two pins from being hit with the mortar. They are veterans because they are airborne. So let's see if they can pass on an eight or less. They do not, so they just go down. No negative as they did not roll a food bar. The last one. So I'm going to attempt to activate them. They do have two pins on them, and they've lost their NCO, so they're kind of got a minus three. Oh, so they need a six and below. Let's see, this is going to be risky. Risky, risky. Barely. Oof. That is, that is very lucky. Let's so move down a pin, down to one pin. And I will have them run up the board. So the last die is mine. Um, generally at this point, um, I'd say not to worry about it because all that I have left is the medic, and the medic is just going to go down. He's not, he's not going to try and do anything. So that will be all the dice. And they will go back in the bag. Oh, thank you. I sound like the zombies from Minecraft. two on this. Advance the flame door. So again, roll within the three. You're going to attempt to fire again. Finally hit. All right. So now the flame door is hit. It's not going to be D6 shots, right? I can't remember. Vehicles. Vehicles. It's been a while. It's the same, it's the same as a normal flame door. 
total amount of shots. Okay, right, right, right. So the flamethrower was actually hit. Roll for how many shots? Five shots. Or five hits, rather. And then what is your armor? Uh, the Bruin Walker is a 8 plus damage value. And a plus 3. So I will need 6 is to pen, 5 is to glance. And yeah, it doesn't matter because top armor, whatever. So 5 and 6s. Okay, so I got 1 5 and 1 6. Now I have to check morale, and they are more than likely going to fail. Uh, so they fail. So they basically run away. No, my flamethrower's sh shot does not lose all its gas. Okay, next time. So I believe at this point, the Amer I, I would call it at this point, the Americans have lost the beachhead. They're completely pinned down. They're all running away. There's not much I can do. Um, I could try and rally these guys, but they're just going to sit there and then they're going to take fire. Those guys have to rally as well, um, and they're also trying to get off the board. So at this point, I would go ahead and call it a Pyrrhic victory, but it is still a victory for the Australians. So it was, that was a fun game. Um, don't like losing. I'm a bit competitive, but it was, it was a fun game. I really enjoyed it. It was really crazy both ways. Um, I'd have to say my MVP is definitely the Bruin. Uh, the Bruin was throwing rockets left and right and having a blast. Quite literally. Um, he got taken out by the flamethrower in the end, but I think he did a pretty good job and uh, we held the beach for as long as we could. It was a very, like Scott kind of mentioned before, a very pyrrhic victory for me because I had incredibly high doubts when we first started. Any kind of beach landing is just rough, miserable. Hard to get off those beaches. Just Gotta hard. expect a lot of casualties. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so, like Scott said, my MVP was the flamethrower. Like, when you compare the points values, it took out the most amount of points, and it just got that Bruin off the field. And if, you know, with, that, with what he could have done the next couple turns, if we actually continued on, he could have just kept causing Rampage back here. Um, but yeah, it was a really great game. This is my our first time using this terrain, this map. It's just really great. First time using both of these armies, actually. Correct, this is yeah. your first time using the Australians for conflict. Yeah. Um, if you guys would like to kind of see more of this kind of play bolt action, play Conflict 47, uh, make sure you check out our Facebook page, uh, Tide, Tidewater Warlord Gamers. Um, we would love to have you. We'd love to give you tips. You know, you make a comment or post on there. We'll, there's about five of us in the admin group that we'll just easily type up. We'll love to kind of connect, connect with you, answer any questions, comments, concerns, uh, any kind of painting tips. Uh, we all use a variety of everything we can, um, any kind of third party companies, anything that you would need. We'd love to help you out. Yep, we, the Warlord Gamers page is for any Warlord game if you're interested in conflict. Uh, we, we have plenty of armies for that. We have extra armies too for demos if you like. Um, we have all other types of games for Warlord. Um, as I mentioned before, all of their medieval combat up into their Napoleonic era and beyond. Um, Warlord's a fantastic company. I've always been impressed with their miniatures. They're very good. Um, I'm actually a, a sergeant for Warlord Games, so uh, I can, if you communicate with me, talk with me, I can tell the store, hey, these guys are looking to get into Hail Caesar or Blood Red Skies, any of that. Can you get some stuff in the store? Can we get it from Warlord itself? And I'll be happy to do what I can, answer any questions, help out with that. I, I love teaching, I love showing people the game, and I just love playing it. And we will see you guys next time. Peace!